the single most important story of our lifetime that very few people are talking about. All right. So you got to hang with us. It involves China and all kinds of other things. Take us on a journey. All right. Here we go. The most important story that no one is talking about is the demographic winter that the world is facing. Two weeks ago on Bill Maher's show, he made a joke about overpopulation. Overpopulation is what we call a zombie idea. It still is this myth that keeps rising from the dead that is absolutely not true. This week, the latest numbers of fertility rates around the world were released. Fertility rates mean the, basically the average number of children for the average woman. And the number has to be 2.1 to have basically a sustainable future. So every woman needs to have an average of 2.1 kids. Whenever I talk about this to high school kids, they're like, what's a 0.1 kid? And what's I'm like, it's not a cocker spaniel. It's an average. You know, it's called math kids. I know it's, you know, mm. uh, but, but the, the, the point is, is that when I first started tracing this, which was well over 10 years ago. It was because of being exposed to the work of a researcher on this demographic number who was starting to notice the falling below of fertility rates across the Western world, a guy named Bernard Lewis. His numbers were, well, the replacement rate is actually not 2.1, it's actually 2.4. And the other big number he gave was 1.7, which is once you fall below that fertility rate, for any extended period of time, it's very hard to recover because you just have this cascading effect of not enough kids marrying and not enough kids and that sort of mm-hmm. stuff. And um, it's just too hard to recover. At the time, there were just a handful of countries, Scandinavian countries, very highly secularized countries that were meeting that 1.7 number. Most were falling below 2.1, but hadn't fall, fallen below 1.7. This number has been in decline ever since. It leveled out a bit in some countries during COVID. And by, by leveling out, it's like, imagine this kind of downward trajectory to the right. And then, you know, it kind of smooths out. And then what we're seeing now since COVID is a falling off the cliff. These numbers are so absolutely alarming. We're just not having enough children. And what this means is, unless there's a reversal, and the problem is with these numbers, it's hard to imagine a reversal, then you're going to see dramatic drops. In other words, the overall trend line for the global population, given how widespread these numbers are, it, it, it really is hard to imagine. You know, we now look and say every city I go to feels crowded. Every airport, certainly the Denver airport feels inexplicably, inexplicably crowded. Who are these people? Where are they all going? Why are the roads all clogged? And that's how we sense and that, that's how we feel it. But you can look to China where you have these infrastructures built for these large populations and you're starting to see some of them abandoned because they of course have tried to control fertility in that law that you know in the, through the one child policy and then they realized oh no and they went to a two child policy and now a three child policy and they sustain this falling below the fertility rate for so long that now they had infrastructure infrastructure that they had to build for their quote unquote overpopulated country that now is lying empty. So imagine, you know, 100 years, 50 years from now when you kind of see this all play out and the cascading effect of not enough children marrying and having children with not enough children and so on. Where does this leave us? Well, it leaves with a population, a global population that is dramatically declining. Now, here's what I mean when I say these numbers are bad. There are very few Western countries that are meeting that 1.7 mark. America is below the 1.7 mark. No one's close to 2.1 in the Western world. It's also spread to the developing nations like Mexico. The Western nation that was the longest holding on was Australia. It's now below that 1.7 mark, not just 2.1, although we're, the, the chart looks at the last couple of years. Uh, think about kind of the former Soviet countries, you know, that are really part of the developing world. None of these countries are, are, are meaning this. Now, you, you also have the challenge that in a lot of Western countries, think Russia or, you know, global dominant countries, the population rate is so low. And yet the ones that are still having children there, and you could say the same thing about Britain, you can say the same thing about France, tend to be Islamic families. What's interesting is when I first started looking at this, most Islamic countries, their numbers were like seven. All right. Wow. 
What's interesting is the Islamic countries that are listed in this chart are now below four. So you're seeing this global trend even as many of these Islamic countries become more and more westernized. One of the most interesting ones is Iraq. Now, of course, where Iraq's going to go, you know, with the Taliban back in control and the subjugation of women, we'll see. What's not shown here are the kind of, you know, Indonesian Islamic countries which tend to have a really high birth rate still and the African ones. But there, there's like the only exceptions of countries that are meeting this replacement rate are Islamic countries, but they have plummeted too, except for there's this handful. We're seeing an uptick in Hungary, Hungary because of some policies of Orban. And we're also, Israel is now above, stays above mm-hmm. the replacement rate, which is crazy considering what they've gone through over the last two years. Now, some of those numbers prob of October 7th, probably and, and being in wartime, which tend to drop those numbers, haven't been kind of fully reckoned with given the timing of it. But you're seeing a global anti-natalism. You're seeing some very acute issues you talk about in a country like China. Where, where, all, where is this all going? First of all, we've all collected in cities. What happens if the global population drops by 20, 30, 40 percent? In the you know coming decades, what happens to all this infrastructure that we're building, right? The whole conversation around paid family leave in the vice presidential debate, you look at this and you go, I, by the way, I'm for paid family leaves. What families? Like these numbers are showing there's just that not not many workers that are kind of coming. And it's it's kind of classic, like the you know, the government swooping in to solve a problem that no longer exists after it's been a problem for years. Uh, every few years, you hear this headline of some scientists in China that have cloned embryos and grown them to certain cell counts and that sort of stuff. There are the very little bioethical kind of regulatory framework things that we impose on our science. They've got none. And especially if it's being driven by state concerns and state mm-hmm. wants. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. So here's what here's what we're going to see within 40 years in China. Two things. Number one, because they're going to control the population. They understand the consequences, for example, for caring for the elderly and providing the social safety net, which is way, way, way bigger. And, you know, basically um, this kind of state enforced communist thing. What what we're going to see in our lifetimes, you and me and our age people, is trying to go from a one child policy to forced fertility. We will see that. We will see them going from you can't have any more than one child to you have to have children. Mm-hmm. We've already talked about how that shift has gone from don't have too many children to government officials calling newlyweds and encouraging them to have some babies. Mm-hmm. So, you know, encouragement to state regulatory, that's a small step indeed, especially there. And this maybe I'm completely jumping the gun here on this sheet, which was a crazy story. but. If an 81 year old rancher in Montana is able to clone sheep, uh, you know, China's cloning humans. You know that in terms of our biggest, it, it, you know, a, a nation like that thinking their biggest, uh, hole in natural or national resources is the lack of humans. You're going to see the human cloning, uh, I think there. And th- you think about the ethical things that, that this creates. Forced fertility and human cloning. Now, look, everyone's going to go, you got, you're crazy. Stone Street, you're off your rocker. You heard it here first. I'm just dropping my mic right here. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking we're going to see. Last thing I'll say, what an opportunity for the church. Do we believe babies are good? One of our colleagues just told my wife and I a story, a young couple in a small group at a church and was asked, what's marriage for? Went around the room. The answer was, it's about friendship. It's about showing Christ's love to somebody else. Da, 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 da. He piped up and goes, I think all that's really important, but the core thing is about having babies. And the leader told him not to bring stuff like that up again because there were young couples there who were married, who had chosen not, not dealing with infertility, who had chosen not to have children. Folks, what that reveals is what do we mean by discipleship? How are yeah. we discipling young couples to be married? This is to go back to the Manhattan Declaration. Manhattan Declaration was just talking about the definition of marriage. 
you can't get the definition of marriage if it's disconnected for what the purpose of marriage. And I don't, I'm not saying the only purpose of marriage is procreation, but to say that procreation is not a purpose of marriage and to bring that up offends people who, you know, haven't followed their heart that way. You know, th- this is the confusion. And so here we have maybe an incredible opportunity for Christian witness pointing to God's created order is good. 